G'day, my name's Mr. Lewis and I'm going to be taking you through a series of videos all to do with biology. These videos are going to be specific to the Victorian curriculum and to the Victorian Certificate of Education. So let's get started. I'm going to be starting with, as you can tell, one of the most beautiful, wonderful molecules in the entire planet. And that molecule is water. Yeah, so why would we be talking about water when we are talking about a biology subject? Well, apart from it being uh, the place where life exists and you know it's required for life, um, there are some amazing properties of water that allow it to be uh, used in a lot of biological processes. And we're going to be talking about those throughout this series, so it's really important that we get the ground, uh, hit the ground running, and start off by uh, by by talking about water. So let's get going. Here it is, our beautiful water molecule. And it actually exists like this in nature as well. It has a V-shape, uh, be due to its polarity. Uh, we know it as H2O, uh, thanks to the two hydrogens that are attached at the top of it and the oxygen at the bottom, or in the, you know, in this case, how I've drawn it, like a Mickey Mouse uh, figure. And there's a reason for its shape like this and the way that it's joined together. Hydrogen is our first element on the periodic table. It consists of one proton and one neutron in its nucle uh, nucleus, but on its outer shell surrounding it sits one electron. So you can have a maximum of two electrons in your first shell, and if you're a larger molecule or larger atom like oxygen is, you can have a maximum of eight in your second shell. So hydrogen has one electron in its first shell. Great, it's got the, this uh, evens out its charge, so at the moment there's no positive or negative charge on this entire molecule. Oxygen, on the other hand, is our eighth uh, uh, element on the periodic table, excuse me which means that it's going to have eight protons, eight neutrons usually, but a magical eight electrons. They fill up that first shell first. So that first shell has a beautiful two electrons in it. Now that comes for the second shell. The second shell gets a couple more. So here's our electrons equaling all the way up to eight. Now that leaves two. I usually pair them up when I do drawings like this. It doesn't necessarily sit like this, and there's a lot of different theories, but this is just a good visualization for how it looks. So here's our two empty spaces on oxygen. So this suggests how these guys are joined together. In the outside shell, these electrons are what we call valence electrons. They sit in our outside shell. Uh, and atoms are really good at sharing or giving up valence electrons, and that's how these guys uh, stick together. So, so oxygen is going to have these uh, six electrons sitting in its shell, its outer shell. So there's three, four, five, and I'll put six over here. And it really wants to fill this outer shell, like it wants to have a full outer shell. So it's going to look for someone, or another element, that's willing to give up two electrons. Lo and behold, here come two hydrogens. Now hydrogen only has one out of two, so it doesn't matter. It can go either way. It can give up one or, or, or gain one. That's why, you know, hydrogen gas is usually H, is H2 because they share between each other. Um, but this time they're going to give their two uh E's over, their two electrons over to oxygen and complete its outer shell. So oxygen gains two electrons and hydrogen loses two electrons. And this is what we call covalent bonding. And this is why our oxygen molecule bonds together so strongly. Um, they're pulled together. It also answers the question as to why we have these different zones or this shape of our oxygen, uh, sorry, <laughs> water molecule. And that's because this zone up here, thanks to giving up the two electrons, is slightly positively charged. 
while this zone down here, excuse my pad drawing, is slightly negatively charged. And that's because oxygen gained two electrons, so it gains negative charge, and hydrogen give up electrons. So they give up a, a negative charge and get a positive charge. And this gets uh, gives it a, a certain polarity. So there's a pol you know, there's polar zones in this entire uh, in this entire drawing. <coughs> Uh, so, if we were to uh, now have a look at this molecule, and, uh, and uh, we know that they don't exist on their own, we know that these little molecules are actually entirely part of a larger system. So they all kind of sit together like this. And our water molecules, in fact, have a way of sitting together. Um, you'll notice that the hydrogens are pointing towards the oxygens when, in general speak, uh, when they are you know, sitting like this um, in, in a group. And that's because the hydrogens are being pulled. You know, there's a, there's a pull attraction the positives of the hydrogens are being pulled to the negative charge of the oxygen in you know, near them. And this pull, this charge that allows them to be pulled like this, is actually what we call hydrogen bonding. So they're stuck together like this. This is how, you know, water molecules all stick together as a fluid or as a solid or as a gas and steam up all over the place. And, um, and yeah, it's, this is one of the amazing things or amazing qualities of oxygen. Because of this, <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of this uh, hydrogen bonding, it gives it a certain other quality called cohesion. So the strength of this bond is giving it like a barrier. It's holding it together in a cohesive way. And that's important for the next um, things that we're trying to get our heads around. So we have hydrogen, we have covalent bonds joining the molecules together, uh, the, the water molecule, you know, the oxygens to the hydrogens. And then we have hydrogen bonds joining the hydrogen, uh, sorry, the water molecules all together to give it cohesion. So what happens if we add some other friends into the mix here and we bring in a couple more water molecules, you know, adding to the mix. And we also add in some uh, some other molecules. These are sodiums and chlorides, or sodium chloride joined together, uh, sodium, uh, salt molecules, they're sodium. Um, no, sorry, sodium chloride, we knew that. <clears throat> so uh, we're gonna get our glass of water here. We're gonna add some salt. We're gonna stir it up really, really quickly, adding a bit more, you know, chemical reaction, a bit more, a uh, bit more, uh, action going on in the glass. What do we expect to have happen? Well, most people understand that salt dissolves in water. So what's happening when salt dissolves in water? Well, the sodium and the chloride molecules separate. The water molecules don't separate. They stay together, but they do in fact go ahead and bond. They cause, you know, their own form of bonding to the so the individual sodium and individual chloride molecules. And you'll notice again that that whole hydrogen, that polarity bonding is, is occurring again. So chloride is slightly negatively charged, sodium slightly positively charged. And so you've got the positive charge attract to the negative and the negative charge apart attract, or the negative zone attract to the positive charge. Now they do this because these molecules are what we call polar. Their pole, uh, sodium is a polar molecule. It separates to have um, different ions and different charges. That quality in water uh, breaks through the cohesion and, uh, and allows sodium to kind of mix in and penetrate it all and dissolve. Because these ionic substances dissolve in water, because we call them polar, they also be given another name, and that is hydrophilic. They are water-loving molecules. They love the water and they want to stay in it as for as long as possible. Uh, so, <clears throat> what if we bring in another molecule? We're going to be bringing in uh, carbon tetrachloride. It's a, it's a carbon molecule with four chloride atoms attached to it. And it tries to uh, mix in with the water. And this type of carbon tetrachloride is sometimes found in oils. It really seem to be doing the same thing, does it? And like it's not really kind of getting in there at all. And that's because carbon tetrachloride doesn't separate out. It's not an ionic compound. So therefore, it's nonpolar. And nonpolar molecules don't mix with water at all. 
okay? So they can't break through the cohesive barrier. Then, you know, the water molecules stay stuck together and, uh, and that hydrogen bond, those hydrogen bonds just aren't broken thanks to something like a, an ion charge pulling them apart. Non-polar molecules also have their own little name. They're hydrophobic. We call them hydrophobic, water-hating in this kind of instance. So that kind of brings us to the end of this uh, of this very quick lesson on water and why it's such a, an amazing molecule. Please look out for more episodes and uh, and you'll be able to go take this information into the next episode, uh, into the entire series, sorry, not just the next episode, into the entire series as we continue.